Uh, this was the theater of the really unexpected yeah. tonight, Jim. Here now on SMB Boxing, we present to you the top 15 most bizarre fight endings. We won the title on a stretcher. For this list, we've decided to omit bizarre knockouts and stoppages, as they deserve a video of their own, and they are often more controversial than strange. Unbelievable! Richard Steele stopped the fight with fewer than five seconds to go! If you enjoy our videos, please leave us a thumbs up, and if you're new to the channel, consider subscribing for more great boxing content. In the first round of a junior welterweight fight against Jeremy Bryan in 2010, Daniel Mitchell appeared to suffer mysterious injuries to both of his eyes. A minute into the fight, Mitchell indicated to the referee that he had been elbowed during a clinch and held a glove up to his right eye. And lead here against the lefty. We'll see how that works out for him. The double left hook, and we've already got our first headbutt, according to Mitchell at least. As the round moved into the last 45 seconds, Mitchell began to paw at his left eye despite not taking any clean punches on that side, and it troubled him right up until the bell to end the round sounded. And he was hanging on. He still got He's problems with that eye. Big, think. big problems with the eye, and he was tying on and actually was about to take a knee. He's in deep trouble here. He has to fight out, or Randy Newman can stop this. You don't want to be stranded right there, and he's making it obvious the eye bothers him. In the corner at the end of the round, Mitchell is clearly heard complaining about being elbowed while holding a glove up to his left eye. How much does he want to go on here? I think he's taking the fight out of him with the eye, and eye injury is severe. A replay of the first right eye incident is shown, but there is no obvious foul in sight. There's nothing there, Dave. Uh, he got. Uh, what, he get sweat in his eye or something? There's no, there's no thumb, there's no headbutt. I think he's got sweat in his eye. Could be. Open it up, open it up. Ah. He doesn't want to fight. Can't fight, can't see, can't fight. During further replays of the first right eye incident, commentator Bob Sheridan suggested that Mitchell faked an injury, then forgot which injury he faked. You know, he's grabbing the right eye, but in, in the corner when he's sitting down, it's the left eye that he was complaining oh. about. What's this all about? Is this guy trying to fool us? See, there he is indicating his left eye is a problem, but we clearly saw that he was complaining about his right eye in the replay. He forgot what I he heard. How strange indeed. After complaining that he couldn't see to the ringside doctor, the fight was stopped, and Brian was awarded a TKO victory. Jeremy Brian. In the last 30 seconds of a WBO welterweight fight, Jesse Vargas landed a monster right hand that left Timothy Bradley looking like he was out on his feet. Make sure of finishing the fight in good order. Less than 30 seconds go. Hard right hand by Vargas. Wobbles Bradley. With eight seconds left, Vargas was looking to close the show when the referee, Pat Russell, stepped between the two fighters and waved his arms as if to signal that Vargas had won by TKO. Not time to exchange. He needs to hold and get through these 10 seconds and hope he did enough to win this fight. What, what happened? Oh, no, I'm not no. Sure what in the world no. Pat Russell is doing. Despite Vargas's prolonged celebrations, it soon became clear that Russell mistakenly thought that the 10 second warning was the final bell, and he signaled for the end of the round and not for a TKO victory for Vargas. The 10 second warning is what Pat Russell heard. He stopped the fight because he felt the bell had rung. Vargas is celebrating as though he won by stoppage. Russell is explaining to Carl Moretti of main events right now that he has not won by stoppage, that he thought the fight was over. The fight went to the judges' scorecards, and Bradley was awarded a points decision victory. After the result was announced, HBO's Max Kellerman interviewed Russell. And the loser of the fight had the winner hurt with 10 seconds to go. Yes, I know. I, I hate to ask you, but how do you feel after a, a moment like that? Oh, I, I made the call that I made based upon what I heard. That's yeah. all I can say. It was an honest call on an honest issue. After the bell at the end of the first round, WBA and IBO champion Guillermo Rigandau nailed challenger Moises Flores with an overhand left to the head that sent him down in a delayed reaction. You see how a round where nothing's really going on, Moises was, was oh, pushing. Oh, that's a uppercut as well, and a left hand after the bell, and down goes no, Flores. No, but is no, that no. right? Hang on a minute. Controversy here.
Referee Vic Draculich didn't count Flores out and waited to see if he could get up before calling the fight off. Oh dear, what are we going to have here, Paulie? As he's laid out. I don't know, I want to see that replay again. Rigandau and his corner celebrated, but Draculich and the executive director of the Nevada State Athletic Commission, Bob Bennett, were unsure about how to deal with the situation. Bob Bennett's there. If he got hit after the bell and he was holding the hand, he's be cute. I'm gonna. Well, I'm not saying he's be cute. It's up to you. You're the sole it's arbitrator. Up to you me. do what you think is best. Disqualification okay. is got, looking he, he likely. After several minutes of discussions, Draculich and Bennett were allowed to review footage of the end sequence without audio on a ringside monitor. Although the broadcast footage clearly showed that Flores was hit unintentionally after the bell. He, you go out cold before you hit the ground. Instead, he's standing, oh look, he even raised his right glove. Draculich and Bennett were told on the phone by a member of the production crew that Flores got hit with a legal punch before the bell. He got hit and then the bell rang. Yeah. Thank you. I don't think I've ever seen a review like this. Draculich and Bennett relied on the information from the production crew member, and Rigandau was awarded a first round knockout victory. You got what you deserved. You did get hit after the bell, but you got what you deserved. This is not the way. He, he was trying to steal the championship of the world. And that is, that is a, a pull. Two weeks later, after Draculich and Bennett and the Nevada State Athletic Commission fully reviewed the fight, the result was changed to a no contest. Hall of Fame referee Mills Lane makes his first of three appearances on this list. However, this incident didn't go down as one of his finest moments. In the fourth round of what had been a scrappy affair between IBF middleweight champion Bernard Hopkins and the number one contender Robert Allen, Lane, while attempting to separate the fighters from a clinch, accidentally pushed Hopkins through the ropes and down to the ringside floor. Allen got in a wicked left uppercut there and continues to hold it. Mills Lane trying to break Allen away from Hopkins and he goes through the ropes and down to the ground. A knockdown for Mills Lane. Mills actually pushed him through the ropes. Now it wouldn't be something if he, if he couldn't continue. Now look at it, he's still down. He's still down there. He fell all the way down to the ground. Unbelievable. That's, that's a drop of about three feet while you're moving. Now the crowd, he's not up. He is not up. With Hopkins grimacing in pain and saying that he had hurt his left ankle too badly to continue, the fight was ruled a no contest. Therefore, this is now a no contest. Bernard Hopkins retains his title. The trilogy between Terry Norris and Luis Santana is easily the most bizarre in boxing history. In their first fight in Mexico City, heavily favored WBC champion Norris outworked veteran challenger Santana in the first two rounds before suffering a flash knockdown in the third round and then having a point taken away for a headbutt in the fourth round. And they're taking a point away for the headbutt from Terry Norris. Although the fight was even in terms of the scoring, Norris was clearly getting the better of the action early in the fifth round. Like he was pulled down. Oh, look at these short, crisp uppercuts by Norris. Coming into the final minute of the round, Santana collapsed flat on his back after Norris hit him with a rabbit punch on the back of the head. He's hurt. Santana goes down on his back. He hit him in the back of the head. He hit him in the back of the head. I think no. we're going to have a problem with this qualification possible. A timeout was called by the referee, and the ringside doctor was immediately brought into the ring to check on Santana. Seat cushions, pads keep coming into the ring, being provided by the arena. Marcia de Torres, let's hope we don't have a riot on our hands here. Santana looked to be in serious trouble, but was not given any medical attention from the doctor, and instead he was urged to get up and continue. You know, this is amazing. Here's a guy been laying there unconscious for about two minutes. Nobody's done anything to him medically. And the folks, he really is out. What about the treatment? Are you allowed? Yes, you know. The doctor, instead of trying to examine him and find out neurologically, is there anything wrong with him? They haven't looked in his eyes. They haven't done anything. He's trying to yeah. talk him into getting up. The big picture. picture. That. After three minutes, the fight was finally called off but Santana remained on his back for a further six minutes before being stretchered out of the ring. As Santana was being carried out of the arena, it was announced that Norris had been disqualified and Santana was the new WBC Super Welterweight Champion. They gave the title to Santana via disqualification foul. He won the title on the stretcher. Replays appeared to show that the punch, although illegal, was a glancing blow 
and not a full-blooded shot. Here you'll see him, he ducks the right hand, spins behind him, and hits him right back on, right in the back of the head. I don't know, it didn't look like it could do this much damage, but you never can tell, especially to the skull. It was later revealed that Santana suffered a mild concussion and spent a night in a hospital as a precaution. Because of the strange circumstances, the WBC ordered an immediate rematch. Five months later at Caesars Palace in Las Vegas, 12 to 1 favorite Norris looked determined to exact revenge from the opening bell and almost knocked Santana down at the end of the first round. Norris's domination continued, and he knocked Santana down in the second and the third round. Norris looked to be on the verge of a knockout win, but unbelievably, lightning struck twice when Santana went down from a punch after the bell at the end of the third round. Final seconds of round three. Fight after the bell, and Terry Norris may have just got himself disqualified again. This time, the fight was waved off straight away, and Santana received immediate medical attention. Norris was visibly distraught and claimed that he never heard the bell. What could be going through Terry Norris's mind? He can win this fight any one of ten different ways. He can win with the power. He can win with the boxing. He's all over Santana here. Why, in a fight in which he's already scored two knockdowns, would he land a shot after the bell? It is not a loud bell here a ringside at Caesars. It is possible that Norris never heard the bell. Luis Santana is getting immediate medical attention at this point. Norris is just beside himself in the ring, feeling that it may happen to him again, no doubt. In another case of deja vu, it was announced that Norris had been disqualified while Santana was leaving the arena on a stretcher. Well, it is almost in incredible, Dave. How do you get disqualified two fights in a row against the same opponent in basically the same manner? Four months later, and again in Las Vegas, Santana and Norris met for the third consecutive time. I'm um, listen for the bell, make sure I don't hit him on the head. <laughs> um, you know, I want people. I don't want people to think I'm. I'm. Uh, I'm out there trying to cheat anybody and trying. You know, I beat the best. Norris, again a heavy favorite at 20 to one, delivered on his pre-fight promise and legally knocked Santana down three times in the second round to win back the WBC super welterweight title. Minute left for Terry Norris to finish his band, puts another two rights down the pipe. They were down the pipe, it was a good comeback, another right hand, and that just stops the fight. And Terry Norris has regained his championship. In the second round of a 2002 super lightweight fight between Ricky Hatton and Stephen Smith, Hatton unleashed a barrage of punches that forced Smith onto his knees. Smith just hasn't been able to establish any sort of respect and he's cut. The right eye's cut. Looked as though it was the left hand that did it and he's gone down. As the count was being administered, Smith's father and trainer, Darkie Smith, stormed into the ring to manhandle referee Mickey Van because he thought that Hatton should have been penalized for an elbow. The right eye has gone and he's suggesting to his corner that it was the elbow that did it. This protest from Stevie Smith. Oh, what's going on? Darky Smith, his father, is in there. He's in the ring. What is happening here? Remonstrating with Mickey Van and Van saying, come on, get out of there. And he's waved it all over. And that's got to be a disqualification. And that is a disgraceful scene. Van, following the rules of the British Board of Control, which state that only the referee and two fighters can be in the ring while a fight is in progress, disqualified Smith and awarded the fight to Hatton. From Manchester, England, Ricky, the Hitman Hatton. Will Tomlinson's IBO world title defense against Daniel Ruiz in 2012 was abruptly brought to a halt before the start of the eighth round when a power outage knocked out the lights in the arena and the broadcast from Fox Sports was cut off. Oh, 
After a 10-minute delay, Fox Sports were able to go back on the air thanks to an external generator. However, the arena had no backup lighting available, and the officials were left with no option but to go to the judges' scorecards, where Tomlinson was awarded a technical decision victory. So under the lights of mobile phones and cigarette lighters, and that's about it, uh, Steve Smoger raised the hand of Wild Will Tomlinson. We've already shown you a ridiculous example of a fight ending after a fighter fell through the ropes in Bernard Hopkins, and fighters getting knocked out of the ring or falling out of the ring has happened a fair few times in boxing history. However, none have exited the ring quite like Kermit Cintron did during the fourth round of a super welterweight fight against Paul Williams in 2009. Three won those rounds, two to one Williams. Now they're trading shots. What happened, Emmanuel? Well, and now they both go out of the ring, and Cintron has taken a horrific fall off the edge of the canvas onto the floor. Cintron lay on his side for several minutes before the ringside doctor decided that he was in no position to continue. Although both men were sent off balance after tangling legs, the replays did appear to show Cintron deliberately diving out of the ring before rolling off a ringside table and onto the floor. Right now you see Paul Williams has just decided he's going to have to let it all go out, whether he gets hit or not. And as soon as he lands a punch, you know, this happens right here. And it's uh, just when the fight was starting to get good. Yeah, he landed on it with his back onto a table. Under the California state rules, the fight went to the judges' scorecards and similar to the first two Nora Santana fights, Williams was announced as the winner by a technical split decision as Cintron was being stretchered out of the arena and put into a waiting ambulance. And just to add insult to injury, he was judged the loser in the fight. The 1991 heavyweight fight between Riddick Bowe and Elijah Tillery ended like something you would expect to see in the WWE. This is the sixth fight in seven months, and uh, the two fighters uh, starting before the bell. Riddick with that uh, smirk. Towards the end of the first round, Tillery was knocked down, and although he got up, the bell to end the round appeared to be very late. When the referee finally told the fighters to go back to their corners, Bo jabbed Tillery after he blew him a kiss. In retaliation, Tillery kicked Bo, which then sparked a full-blown brawl that ended with Bo's manager, Rock Newman, grabbing Tillery in a headlock and pulling him backwards over the ropes and onto the floor. There were still several seconds to go. It seemed like a long round. There's the bell, and now some extra work. Oh, a little kickboxing by Elijah Tillery. Bo won't stand for that. Rock Newman, the manager of Riddick Bo, and a tag team comes in, and Elijah Tillery does a 360, a spill out of the ring. Pandemonium in the ring at the end of round number one. And uh, at this point, I believe Tillery has been disqualified from the fight. Why? I don't know. Referee Carl Milligan has got to keep control of the match. When order was restored, the referee disqualified Tillery for flagrantly kicking Bo. Therefore, the winner by disqualification, Riddick, Big Daddy Bo. Riddick, we've seen the tape several times now. What was your bird's eye view of what was going on? Well, actually, I was just getting warmed up and he was taunting me at the end of the round. So I just, you know, kind of like pushed him. And then he, he just went like berserk and what have you, you know. Um, I would have accepted that, but he kicked me. And after that, I just lost him. The 1997 rematch between Mike Tyson and Evander Holyfield is infamous for all the wrong reasons. After suffering a bad cut above his right eye in the second round, which was ruled to have been caused by an accidental clash of heads by Mills Lane, Tyson visibly lost control, and in the third round, he bit a chunk out of Holyfield's right ear. That's the jab Mike didn't have in the first fight. What happened here? He got bit, I think. As Holyfield jumped around in pain, Lane called for a timeout, which then prompted Tyson to shove Holyfield in the back as he walked back to his corner. Oh my goodness, he's got a bloody right ear. Holyfield bit by a dirty Mike Tyson. After seeing the damage to Holyfield's ear and consulting with the ringside doctor, Lane announced he would be deducting two points from Tyson and the fight would continue.
While explaining the decision to Tyson and his cornerman, Lane memorably refuted Tyson's claim that the damage to Holyfield's ear was caused by a punch. Hey, let's see. Look, he bit him in the ear. punch. He was bullshit. Right. It's gonna cost him two points. Two points. Two points off here. With 30 seconds left on the clock, the third round resumed, but Tyson had not calmed down, and within 10 seconds, he bit Holyfield's left ear. Field now. That's a left hook. You know what's funny? Tyson. Mike was having his best friend. He bit him again. He bit him again. Although Holyfield reacted in a similar way to the first bite, Lane was unsighted and let the round finish when Holyfield came forward to fight Tyson. At the end of the round, Lane saw the bite mark on Holyfield's left ear and disqualified Tyson. You're done. You're done. You're done. After the fight was stopped, Tyson attempted to launch himself at Holyfield's corner and threw punches at anyone who tried to stop him. Tyson's trying to get at Holyfield again, I believe. As a result of his behavior during and after the fight, Tyson was fined $3 million and had his boxing license revoked for 15 months. Van Dyne, I'm sorry. You're a champion, I respect that. And I only sat in that the fight didn't go on further that for that the boxing fans of the world might have seen for themselves who would come out on top. In the third round of a 1989 light heavyweight fight, Steve McCarthy had Tony Wilson in trouble against the ropes when Wilson's mother climbed into the ring and attacked McCarthy with a stiletto shoe. <laughs> McCarthy left the ring with a cut to his head and refused to return when asked by the referee. As a result, the fight was awarded to Wilson by a TKO. The decision started a riot among the spectators, and Wilson was showered with plastic cups and bottles as the referee raised his hand. In 1952, German middleweight Peter Muller was disqualified in the eighth round against Hans Stretz when, in response to being repeatedly warned for holding, he knocked out the referee and attacked several other men who got into the ring to restrain him. Now Muller is really throwing leather, Stretz on the receiving end. And then it happens. Muller hits the referee and knocks him out. But Muller couldn't care less. He stays after Stretz. Pandemonium reign. Muller now takes on a few of the spectators after his seconds try to restrain him. Don't be fooled by the obvious inserted shots of the crowd at the moment Muller knocked out the referee. The fight was genuine, and this photo of the incident was published in newspapers and magazines worldwide. Muller initially received a lifetime ban from boxing, but surprisingly, the ban was lifted, and 14 months later, his career resumed. Later, after leaving the ring, Muller is disqualified by the German Boxing Commission. Hans Stretz wins by an eighth round TKO in one of the weirdest fights you'll ever see. The 1980 rematch between Roberto Duran and Sugar Ray Leonard produced the most famous surrender in boxing history. After going toe to toe with Duran and losing five months earlier, Leonard chose to use his boxing ability in the second meeting, especially his speed and movement. Good right hand by Leonard. Duran wasn't being completely blown out of the fight, but Leonard's change of tactics and taunts were visibly frustrating him. Sugar's very confident, like I said. He said he would beat Duran. Good combination by him. labored Duran to get, look at the Yali shuffle now. That's confidence. Sugar Ray is oozing confidence suddenly. Hey, look at that. The kid Gavilan Bolo fight. Dean time, that's the best round for Leonard. Look at Leonard. With 30 seconds left in the eighth round, Duran turned his back on Leonard and waved his glove to signal that he was quitting. The referee, Octavio Mayron, didn't appear to understand the gesture and brought Duran and Leonard together. Duran then allegedly said no mas to Mayron, and as he turned his back for the second time, Mayron waved off the fight and Leonard ran to a neutral corner to celebrate. Duran says no. I think he's quitting. What is he saying, Larry? 
says no. I don't understand. He's saying no, no. He quit. I don't understand it. I think Duran quit. I don't understand it. There have been many theories put forward about why Duran, a man known for his machismo and unwavering will to win, decided to call it a night. However, Duran has always maintained that the reason he stopped fighting was because he was weight drained and suffering with stomach cramps caused by eating too heavily at the morning weigh-in. Dile que me entró un calambre en el estómago y me me puse bien débil de brazo y de pierna y por eso fue que dejé pelear. He got cramps in his stomach and his body and the upper body and then his arms and he got weaker so that's why he stopped fighting. He quit the uh, the, the bout. In 1994, Oliver McCall scored a major upset when he knocked out Lennox Lewis in the second round to capture the WBC heavyweight title. Nine. This fight That's is it. over! It is over! Lewis is incredulous! McCall is celebrating! In the build-up to a rematch three years later for the same belt, McCall's mental state had been questioned following stints in rehab for drug addictions and an arrest for antisocial violence at a hotel less than two months before the fight. Uh, I hope that it was ready and uh, ready to look, make, make that man win. McCall was in good physical shape on the night of the fight and clean of drugs after being tested a few days earlier. However, the first sign of what was about to materialize came during his ring entrance when he ran erratically to the ring. Oh, this is, this is the new gimmick. We will run in and show that we're ready. I told you it'd be different. I expected him to start crying as he did uh, on a fight with, <laughs> with uh, Lewis at Wembley before. This is a new one. For the opening two rounds, the fight seemed relatively normal, with Lewis having a slight edge after establishing a strong left jab and landing occasional right hands. McCall had some success with his own left jab and looked dangerous when he forced Lewis onto the defensive. I think one of the difficult things to overcome, sweeping right hand over the top by McCall, Lewis has the reach advantage, snaps back the head of McCall. His jab is much better in this fight. Lewis returns fire, then they fall in. Good start for Lennox Lewis. In the third round, McCall offered very little offense and took exaggerated steps back whenever Lewis hit him with clean shots. McCall is just a non-factor right now in this third round. Not the case. He just ate another right hand. And now he's trying to be playful after Lewis sent him back throwing a right hand. You know, losing on points, so he's got he's to commit himself to his punches. When the round ended, McCall refused to go back to his corner and instead opted to pace around the ring for the entire 60 seconds. As Manny Stewart and Lennox Lewis plot their strategy, Oliver McCall has not returned to his own corner after that third round. What in the world is he doing? Is this more psychological warfare? Georgie Benton, his trainer, is disgusted by it. In the fourth round, McCall dropped his hands low while walking around the ring and at times looked out to the crowd and shook his head. WBC title. Now he's got his hands down near his waist and he's backing into the ropes. I don't know if Lennox Lewis thinks he's playing possum. Despite McCall looking like a sitting duck, Lewis was hesitant to attack and only occasionally put real force into his punches. I think Lewis is as confused as anybody is in yeah. this arena. Well, he almost caught him with that big right hand there. And now he engages now in the fight. Maybe McCall is playing possum. Midway through the round, Mills Lane called for a timeout to ask McCall if he wanted to fight, and then let the fight resume when he nodded his head. However, the same pattern continued, and at the end of the round, McCall circled the ring before breaking down in tears in his corner. He looks almost like a little kid being punished. And once again, he's not returning to his own corner. A new twist to the plot. Oliver McCall is now crying. Let's listen in. At this point, it was clear that McCall was having a nervous breakdown. And when Lewis hit him with a series of punches early in the fifth round, Lane mercifully stopped the fight. To engage in a heavyweight championship I mean, fight. He, these people didn't pay to see an execution, you know? This something's not right. That's here. it. There that it is. is it. 
The fight is over. Mills Lane at this point left with no other choice. While working on this video, we watched three different broadcasts of McCall Lewis 2 and feel that George Foreman's sympathetic take on the situation directly after the fight is well worth a listen. And George, that was painful. Yeah, but this guy's had a painful life for the last few moments. He's been under counseling for drugs and believe me, there's a great a lot of young people in that fix in the same fix he's in. Someone's going to have to help him. The last thing he needs in his life is the pressure of boxing right now. Yeah, that's a lot of pressure, and the crowd is cheering, and you really, I wanted to just get up there and embrace him and let him know it's going to be okay. McCall continued to have trouble with drugs and the law for over a decade after the Lewis rematch, but he eventually cleaned up his act and is still an active fighter today at the age of 55. Impressively, especially for a heavyweight, McCall has never been knocked down or knocked out in a 73 fight career that has spanned over 30 years. I've been through a lot. God was with me all the way and he's continuing to bring me through everything so he gets the glory through my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. There's Oliver, Oliver McCall, a champion again. Before we show you our number one pick, here are some honorable mentions. A riot broke out at Madison Square Garden after Andrew Galata was disqualified for repeatedly hitting Riddick Bowe below the belt. Just hammering it. That was another low blow. Down that's goes it. Bowe. That's, that's it. That's it. That's it. Great. It's a disqualification. Had there been clearer footage of this incident, it would have been in the top 15. At the end of the 11th round against Virgil Hill, Adolfo Washington accidentally cut his swollen left eye on a TV camera. The, the doctor has also looked into that corner of uh, Adolfo Washington. They still look at that right eye. They're indicating that when Washington bent over, that he bumped his head on the camera as he leaned over in the corner. And it opened that eye up. The fight had to be stopped, and Hill won by a technical decision. In the second round of a 2010 welterweight fight, Randall Bailey picked up Saeed Owali and tipped him over the ropes and onto a ringside table. Owali was carried out on a stretcher, and the fight was ruled a no contest. It was, it was, it was just on my back, and I just lifted up. You know, I, I didn't. I didn't think he was going to go over the, over the top. I just I just lifted up because I went down and he was on my back and I just lifted up. Have you ever happened? Uh, have you ever seen a game like this, a fight like this? I've seen nothing like this before. Before the start of the 2018 heavyweight fight between F.A. Ajagba and Curtis Harper, everything looked like a normal fight should. Both men were introduced to the crowd and listened to the referee's final instructions and touched gloves. Touch up. Good luck to both of you guys. However, moments after the opening bell, Harper climbed out of the ring and walked out of the arena, leaving Ajagba and everyone else stunned. Without a single punch thrown, Ajagba was ruled the winner via disqualification at one second of the first round. Easy money. Harper cited never receiving a full contract prior to the fight as the reason for leaving the ring, and he hasn't fought again since the incident. Do you agree with our list? Are there any bizarre endings that we missed? Let us know in the comments. Thanks for watching SMB Boxing, and we'll see you in the next video. What unbelievable upper body movement defensively. Four punches missed with the head movement. He's got everything here in this second round going. And now a combination.